Bill Maher's new rules segment on Friday went after the Democratic base for, you know, having standards and holding politicians uh, to those standards. Uh, let's check it out, and then I have a lot to say about it. And finally, new rule, no more swiping left on perfectly good presidential candidates. Nearly 45 million Americans now identify themselves as Democrats, and all of them are running for president. <laughs> this time, let's give them a chance. Let's not eat our own, the way we nitpicked Hillary to death over her emails and other bullshit. <laughs> Kamala Harris has already had to play defense because it's come out that when she was a prosecutor, she prosecuted people. <laughs> not very progressive. She should have found a way to apply more forgiveness, and the fact that she didn't is unforgivable. <laughs> Elizabeth Warren claimed to be Native American. So what? Trump claimed to be human. <laughs> if you think this stupid, blown out of proportion Indian controversy makes her inauthentic, you're the phony. She is the champion of consumer rights in the age of income inequality. When it comes to Elizabeth Warren, I have no reservations. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay. Bernie Sanders, we used to like him, but he didn't personally chaperone everyone on his campaign, so he's a sex monster once removed. <laughs> a candidate has to have tough standards for their staff. Uh, but not too tough. That's Amy Klobuchar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, last week we learned she's view verbally abusive. Then again, this came from the Huffington Post, so I gotta ask, do you mean actually abusive or what millennials think of as abusive. Because... Because... <laughs> I, I think it's like the pain chart in the hospital. And I think my generation's two is your generation's ten. <laughs> so... <laughs> so welcome to the real world, Snowflake. Now go get Amy her coffee and shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Better O'Rourke took oil money. Yeah, he's in Texas. All the money in Texas is oil money. <laughs> the only other job there is operating the mechanical bull. <laughs> it's like complaining Mitt Romney takes money from Mormons. I mean, geez, every Democrat is gonna have some dark spot. In Virginia, it's on their face. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what song Trump plays at his rallies? It's the Stones' You Can't Always Get What You Want, which seems like an odd choice, but it tells you why Republicans are so successful. Because they're not babies who think they can have everything. Evangelicals don't really like Donald Trump. They know he can't even pass a church without bursting into flames. <laughs> <laughs> but... But he got them two justices on the Supreme Court. Yeah, you can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you get what you need. That's their jam. Ours is thank you next. Yeah, he basically gets that exactly backwards. So when you think of the right-wing base, is that what comes to your mind? That, oh, they're understanding and they compromise and that's why they win? No, it's the exact opposite. They had their Tea Party revolution, and it was the rise of the Tea Party revolution which led to their uncompromising candidate candidates, which led to victory. Remember, Donald Trump, one of the things that got him popular early on with that far right-wing base was what? Pandering on the issue of birtherism. The first black president isn't really born uh, here, and he's a, you know, a Kenyan Muslim foreigner. And so he used that issue to ride a wave of popularity. And he, he super served his base. And that's what the Republicans do is they stick by the first rule of politics, which is don't abandon your base. Never slap your base in the face. That rhymed. And it also sounds weirdly sexual. <laughs> Never do that. And the right wing generally abides by that. 
And that's why you get the right wing base is actually excited when it's time to go vote. They get to go vote for their candidates and they've been told everything they want to hear. And so they go vote for their candidates. Now, the left, on the other hand, it has been Democratic bubble conventional wisdom for decades now. Oh, in order for the Democrats to win, you have to run to the right. Because this country is a center-right country and people are more conservative. Now, if that was true, perhaps the Democrats would have never lost a thousand seats under Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Barack Obama. Because that's the strategy they were running. They were running the triangulation strategy, the new Democrat strategy, that's Rahm Emanuel's approach. This is what they were doing. And they lost. They lost a thousand seats. It's only after this new wave of a, a populist left wave, uh, you know, a social democratic wave where people are saying, here's what we're for, uh, you know, Medicare for all, free college, living wage. It was on, on the backs of that movement that we got this massive victory in the last election. As a general rule, the further left you were, the better you did. I mean, look at um, Sherrod Brown, who ran a pretty unapologetically left-wing campaign in Ohio, won as a Democratic senator. And then you have um, in Indiana, what's his name? I see his face in my head, but I'm blanking on his name right now. Joe Donnelly. Joe Donnelly ran basically saying, I'm a right winger. He was praising Reagan in his ads as a Democratic senator. Praising Reagan, saying, I like the idea of the wall, shitting on Medicare for all, and he lost. So Bill's point is, hey, left wing base, can you calm the fuck down, please? Because you're the reason that, you know, the left is losing with your thank you next stuff. When the reality is, instead of berating the base to fall back and change their standards, Bill, you should be rating the Democratic politicians to listen to the fucking base. So you flip the responsibility. Why is it, why is it the onus on the people to fall in line behind the politicians? No, the onus is on the politician to serve the will of the people. So perhaps if the Democrats are losing, they should stop being shitty and stand for something that would definitely get them elected. So let's be more specific here in the breakdown. He says, he says in the beginning that, oh, can we not nitpick uh, our candidate to death like we nitpicked Hillary to death over bullshit? Here's the problem with that, Bill. What the left was arguing against Hillary was not bullshit. I will gladly concede that the arguments from the right against Hillary were largely bullshit. Oh my God, her emails. Oh my God, Benghazi. Just silly stuff. But the arguments from the left were, oh my goodness, the Iraq war killed minimum 200,000 innocent civilians and she supported it and she didn't change her mind on it for an incredibly long time. And she's, she uh, did regime change in Libya. She wants to do regime change in Syria. Um... That seems pretty fucking important to me. Supporting the Patriot Act and destroying our Fourth Amendment protections? That seems pretty fucking important to me. So don't conflate all criticism of Hillary as being illegitimate because then you're a hack. And that's what you sound like. So I don't think it was nitpicking her to death. I think it was genuine, legit criticisms. And the reality is if she had listened to those criticisms and course corrected, she'd be president today. But she didn't do that. She continued to listen to her shitty strategist and do the old dumb strategy of, I need to run further and further right. Well, how'd that work out? Donald Trump outflanked her on her left on certain issues, and he ended up winning. Um, then he, said, he protects Kamala and says, oh my God, Kamala, how dare she prosecute people as a prosecutor? I mean, I know you're a comedian, so your job is to like, make people laugh, but the, how flippant and glib you are about this is insufferable because... Again, the argument isn't, like, that absurd of, like, oh, you're a prosecutor, therefore you're dismissed. No, the argument is, as a prosecutor, you were told you should prosecute Steve Mnuchin, who was foreclosing on grandmas early and kicking them out of their homes, and you didn't foreclose on Steve Mnuchin, the Goldman Sachs lackey, the head of One West Bank. You didn't go after them, you didn't prosecute them. Why? Because uh, you were taking campaign contributions from them. That's corruption. The argument is... Hey, you were a prosecutor, and you supported civil asset forfeiture, which is legalized robbery by cop. The argument is, hey, you were a prosecutor, and you laughed at the idea of supporting legalized marijuana. So as you pretend to be this woke person of color candidate, you're responsible for locking up people of color and destroying their fucking lives. 
And you, Bill Maher, of all people, should understand that, hey, maybe this is one of those issues where there's a red line, and it's a, you're on our team or you're not, when it comes to legalizing marijuana. You, of all people, should take this position, but no, you're going to defend a candidate who laughed at the idea of legalized marijuana and now pretends to be for it? Does anybody really think that she's going to fight tooth and nail to legalize it? When she spent her whole fucking career doing the opposite? He's so smug, I can't take it. Um, like, every actual argument counter to his position, he glibly dismisses and doesn't address. And he strawmans everything about the, the people he disagrees with and then knocks down the straw man. It's just so obnoxious. Now, on the Liz Warren Native American thing, I agree that that one's forgivable. Why is that forgivable? Particularly because it has nothing to do with policy. So, the criticisms that are the most legitimate are policy-based. And you need to deal with those actual criticisms and not just smugly dismiss it. If you want to say, hey, the social justice warrior-ish left that gets wrapped up in non-policy-related issues and they dismiss people based on shit like that, then I agree with you. But he's, throughout this rant, he's, he's conflating the two things. He's conflating legitimate policy criticism with all, like, oversensitive, snowflake, social justice warrior criticism. So, and, and by the way, it's not something, like, I can look past the Elizabeth Warren Native American thing, but I also take the point that there are many people who genuinely look at that and go, eh, really questionable for you to do that. But I can look past it specifically because she's, this, like, one of the top on, on policy issues. Now, on the Bernie Sanders one, he's correct to defend Bernie on this front because Bernie had no idea about any kind of sexual harassment that other people were doing in his campaign. So what's he supposed to do? Stop something he doesn't even know is fucking occurring because nobody even fucking told him? It makes no sense. It was a total smear of Bernie. Now, when he goes uh, to defend Cloud Boot Jar, again, Bill, I don't know about those stories about, oh my God, she's verbally abusive and this and that. I know nothing about that. You know, I saw the articles, but... Is it legit? Is it not legit? I don't know. Does somebody have an axe to grind in the media and so they're running these stories? Or is it somebody who was actually like, no, seriously, she was really bad? I don't know. But what I will tell you is, Cloud Boot Jar is, is dismissed because of her policy positions. Again, this is going to keep coming back to policy because that's what it's about if you're a serious person and you're looking at candidates and who to vote for. Cloud Boot Jar, for example, supports the intelligence agencies come hell or high water. So she's in favor of the Patriot Act and NSA spying and she's routinely supported NSA spying. You know, that's something I can't look past. She doesn't support Medicare for all. She supports all access, expanded access. So, yes, I have policy criticisms of her, and because of those policy criticisms, and she's one of the furthest right candidates in the race, I have no interest in her. Now, you can't flip that back on me and people like me and say, oh, how dare you be so finicky in criticizing candidates. Bill, this is a fucking primary. It's the exact time to criticize candidates. If we can't criticize candidates and have favorites and argue for them, then what the fuck is the point of a primary? Do you just want to abolish fucking primaries? Like, now is the time to make the argument as to why you want that person and not that person. Jesus Christ. Um, and then, of course, he had to do the millennial bashing, or it's like, it, every one of his shows now, he has, it, there's like a, a mandatory minimum of millennial bashing. There's like a quota he has to hit. And there's nothing lazier and dumber than millennial bashing. I mean, we're talking about people who graduated into the worst economy since the fucking Great Depression. Uh, people who were raised in a system where the idiots running it kept sending people to illegal and offensive wars and wasting trillions of dollars doing that. Um, you know, destroyed unions, destroyed uh, labor laws, made it so that the middle class is no longer the middle class. We just have been stagnant since the fucking 1970s. So we were raised in a broken fucking system. And then the people who broke the system turn around and go, Ha! Huh, are you living at home in your basement, fucking bitch? Get up and go do something. Why don't you go do run the world? How about that? It's your turn to run the world. But yeah, because you guys fucked it up beyond all imagination. And now when we try to fix it by picking candidates that are actually correct on the issues, you are condescending and pedantic and saying, No, how dare you have standards for your candidates? Why do we always have to eat our own? Not everything is eating your own. Some of it is logical and reasonable criticism and <laughs> breaking down where they stand on the issues to fix the country. Jesus fucking Christ. I can't stand the millennial bashing. It's the dumbest fucking thing ever. 
and here's this guy, a comfortable fucking multi-millionaire in his studio on his TV show who's like, You guys don't even know what it's like to have it tough. My generation's two for pain is your generation's test. Shut the fuck up and go to your fucking castle mansion and smoke some weed with, you know, whatever, Larry King or whoever the fuck you're hanging out with nowadays with your pampered ass yelling at people who are up to their eyeballs in fucking student loan debt. You, you glib, smug prick. The fuck do you know? You've been in Hollywood for the past fucking couple decades making money by doing a TV show once a fucking week, asshole. Jesus fucking Christ. There's no, there's no, like, trying to understand anybody else's viewpoint. And then, uh, finally, he brings up Bet on My Stork, and he says, Oh, Bet on My Stork takes, um, oil money. Oh, we, we should look past that. Why? You're, you're always yelling about climate change, and then you see that one of these candidates who takes oil money is probably a lot less likely to fix that problem. Why is now not the time to say, hey, we should probably look past him because he's going to be super questionable on one of the most important issues, and we should probably pick a different candidate who's going to be better on that issue? Why wouldn't you do that? Because you're a fucking partisan tribalist hack. And you know how Nina Turner says any old blue just won't do? Your uh, argument is any old blue will do. So even if it's a, even if it's blue... That agrees with red 60% of the time. Yeah, that'll do. What are we gonna do? Stop. Don't eat your own. Don't eat your own. No, the answer is you have to hold your side to strict standards or else you can never get anything done. If you're always gonna vote for people who are gonna stab you in the back, then what's the point of even voting? If you're never gonna get what you want, then why vote? So it, it just, it makes no sense. And the real argument against bet on my stork isn't just that he takes fossil fuel money. The argument is, um, hey, look at his detailed policy record, and David Sirota did a wonderful breakdown in Capital and, and Maine, and, for example, he supported Wall Street deregulation. For example, he supported Fast Track of TPP. For example, he supported, he agreed with Republicans in putting a hatchet in the back of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So, I, it, that's not a little thing, Bill. These are all big things. And do we want to keep picking shitty centrists? You might, but the rest of the country doesn't. And that's actually helped the rise of the right over the years. So how about you step aside and let this new populist left wave do what we do best, which is win and fix the fucking country, something your generation hasn't been able to do.